Thank you for tuning in to Thoughtful Thursday Podcast. On this week's episode, we are reacting to an article on nine effective ways to be a better parent. Uh, joining us on this episode is Nick Walborn, our family pastor, Daniel Fernahu, our executive pastor, Misty Hagman, our all-around utility player and kids director, and myself, Mike Elkins, the lead pastor. We hope you enjoy this episode. Feel free to reach out to us if you have questions or encouraging statements. All right, check it out. All right, guys, thanks for joining us on Thoughtful Thursday, and we're going to jump right in because the last one took us a long time because apparently we all are terrible parents. <laughs> so we're going to continue to see how we're terrible parents and how we're messing up our kids, and hopefully you can join us on that little journey. Uh, so, so far, we just a recap. We've been through, did we go through five of them mm -hmm, last yeah. time? It was boost your child's self-esteem, catch kids being good set limits and be consistent with your discipline, make time for your kids and be a good role model. So we'll get right in to number we six. We could probably just eliminate that last one from the, just edit it out. Edit it. Uh, number six, make communication a priority. What exactly do they mean with that one? That's a good question. Here's what it says. You can't expect kids to do everything simply because you as a parent say so. Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> that was also my thought. Uh, they want and deserve explanations as much as adults do. If we don't take time to explain, kids will begin to wonder about our values and motives and whether they have any basis. Parents who reason with their kids allow them to understand and learn in a non-judgmental way. Make your expectations clear. If there's a problem. Describe it express your feelings, and invite your child to work on a solution with you. Be sure to include consequences, make suggestions, and offer choices. Be open to your child's suggestions as well as negotiate. Kids who participate in decisions are more motivated to carry them out. Well, I'm not sure I agree with a lot of this one. Anybody else? I, so I will say this. Minda and I were both raised in homes where you do not ask any questions. We don't negotiate with terrorists. <laughs> exactly. I have that above my door. <laughs> um, we were raised in homes where you do what I say because I said it, period. I mean, I grew up in a military family, but we both grew up in homes like that. And so, you know, as littles, they ask that, why, why, why? And, they, you know, do they even know what they're asking? Probably not. But. You know, Ellie and Audrey are both at an age now where they're asking why. Um, and I don't think it's unhealthy to give them the reason. Oh, no, not at all. Um, but one conversation that we've had recently with Ellie is you can disagree with me, but you will go and do what I've asked you to do. And after it's done, we can sit down and have a conversation about like, hey, I disagreed with this or that. And there was one specific time where, like, she was just literally arguing with Minda over, you know, well, I don't think it should be done this. I, I don't even recall what it was that was the center of the argument. But I'm like, but just having that conversation was like, hey, you can disagree. Like, you you know, and I want to have a conversation with you because I don't want you just to re resent mm -hmm. and be angry. But it's a both and here. You're mm -hmm. going to do this. And let's talk about it after because mm -hmm. we do have good reasons. And because of the argument, I, I I really cannot even, I can't recall the specifics, but it was, you know, something to help and to protect her. And like, don't play with an ax. <laughs> well, that's, that's one. <laughs> Actually, during our conversation, we talked about that incident. Yeah, and you'll hey, be talking about that one a long time. Do you remember <laughs> when? This is very. You're similar gonna get some mileage out of that one to to that to the accident. Um, and, and so, so I, I don't have any problem having the conversation, but it, but I do care about, you know, the heart attitude behind where they're coming from. Mm -hmm. So my initial response to this uh, prompt is age appropriate. Mm -hmm. Um, this changes drastically at different age seasons. I remember um, 
one of the things I learned and whenever I say I remember, I mean, I loosely remember because I'm going to get the words wrong. It was something through the transitions of um, in your parenting style, you go from kind of dictating. That's not the right word. Right. But that's basically mm-hmm. you're, you're telling. And because I said so is probably good enough, good enough and appropriate. Then you go to teaching. Then you go to Coach. coaching. Then you go to mentoring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And how you have these conversations and communicate changes drastically depending on what season you're in and, yeah, that's and a how good framework. That. Yeah. I like that. When kids are little, obviously they need to listen the first time we speak because we have to keep them safe. Mm-hmm. If we're saying stop, don't yeah. go into the road. They need to know when mom says stop, I stop. When dad says stop, I stop because it keeps me safe. But you're exactly right. Through every age, there's some degree of communication that needs to happen because again, we want to teach them. Mm-hmm. They do need to know that we are their ultimate authority for their safety. I love the, um, and I'm going to probably get this not all right. The Corey Ten Boom story where she says she asked her dad a really hard question. There's a lot of details to this I'm going to leave out, but mm-hmm. she asked her dad a really hard question and he gave her the analogy of um, carrying a suitcase and it being so heavy. And when she's older, she'll be able to carry that suitcase, but for now, let him carry it for her. Mm-hmm. In other words, she didn't need to know all the details yep. about the thing right then she just needed to trust him his wisdom his um parenting and someday she would better understand when she was able to i love that that is good analogy that's a really good story in book Mm -hmm. to read it is so good i listened to the audio book with a couple of my kids and it was really impactful for them Mm -hmm. um yeah i mean you guys said everything i I struggle with this because I do want you to do what I say immediately. I have no problem with asking questions. I mean, a statement I make a lot about faith is God's not afraid of our questions. Questions lead to answers. Answers lead to truth. The truth sets you free. So, like, I'm okay with a questioning spirit. And honestly, I want my kids to question, like, especially as they get older and peer pressure and temptation of, like, well, why do I want to do this? Why why would you do this? Mm -hmm. So, like, I want that, and I'm okay with them asking, but why do I have to do this? Mm -hmm. Like you said, well, I need you right away, all the way, happy heart, then we'll talk about it. Um, And honestly, sometimes my answer is because I said so. Like, I don't have a good reason, honestly. I just, there's something in my parental instincts that says I need you to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. And for right now, that's just going to have to be good enough for you because that's what's going to happen. Yeah. And... I don't like, I don't necessarily know if I agree with the negotiation. I was, I was actually going to so, bring yeah. that up. I actually do, okay. but I, I think it's, again, age appropriate where your kids are at. No, but like if I tell Caleb or Abby, let's take Caleb. I mean, he's a senior in high school. Hey, can I spend the night at my friend's house? No. Why? Like, okay, let's have a conversation. Like there have been times where he will question that decision and begin to negotiate. And ultimately what really gets revealed is like, I have no basis for saying no. I'm just saying no, because Mm -hmm. it's more convenient. It's easier. And like, yeah, maybe I'm thinking through the negotiation wrong because I mean that, you know, like Emil's, you know, it's like, Hey, you need to be done hanging out at 11. Okay. And then like, we'll get a text like, Hey, it's 1130. Okay. Yeah. That's not a problem. I, I mean, it was just an arbitrary number. Right. I guess I just didn't really see that as negotiation and maybe it kind of is negotiation, I guess more in the heat of the moment in a disciplinary yeah. scenario. Like, right. Yeah. 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 That's, what that's where yeah. I maybe disagree with negotiation. Well, I think bit. the unhealthy pendulum swing in the opposite direction. And the one that I've seen a lot, because I feel like the, our friends that are our age or people, just people in general that are our age have littles. Whereas we, our kids are, you know, moving from littles to preteen, I see a lot of unhealthy negotiation of like, if you stop, we'll give you a sucker or a lollipop mm-hmm. or, oh, you know, right. if, yeah. hey, if you be good oh, right now, yeah. I'll do. And that's what I think of when I hear yeah. negotiate. And so I think yeah. that there's like healthy that's bribery. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Terrorism. Well, it's, <laughs> it, it honestly, um, it, it makes me sad and it makes me really concerned for that parent because that looks a lot different <laughs> if that parenting style 
maintains. Right. Sure. When you get to, mm-hmm. you know, Caleb, yeah. like that conversation becomes much different yeah. and tr- the transfer is for sure really scary. And I think like using your example of curfew, um, because we've been in that situation, there, there are times where it makes sense and there are times where it doesn't. If, if your curfew is 11 and you ask for 1130 because you weren't responsible to manage your time or you got caught out like, and you're trying to just push dodge. and ask for more yeah. so mm-hmm. you don't get in trouble, the answer is no. Yeah. But when it's that like, um, you know, hey, we're, we're with a group of friends at their house, parents are there and hey, our movie got started late because of this. It's not going to be over till 1115. That puts me home at 1130. Is that okay? Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. I I saw negotiation as like, all right, I counted to three, and now the punishment's gonna happen. Oh, okay, I'll do it now. I'll do it now. Okay, well, you're not gonna. That's definitely you know. a form of it. Yeah, and unhealthy. I also think like the heart behind it. The d- different kids are wired differently. So, so my, you guys will not be shocked to hear what I'm about to say. Um, I was raised by my mom, and in my teenage years. I so loved and appreciated that my mom and I could have conversations about things that we didn't agree on. And a lot of those might've come down to things that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And she was giving me an answer that I didn't want, but we could have conversations about it. They did not always land in my favor. favor. Mm -hmm. Right. But, um, summer's situation was different. And I think the first time that I like push backed, push backed, pushed back on, <laughs> on her parents there you go. <laughs> um, with something like, I think everyone was shocked and it didn't go well. <laughs> and, like, and, and I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. I was just used to an environment where we could talk about something yeah. mm-hmm. that we disagreed and, on and that, and they weren't, that wasn't their norm. Um, but like my mom was actually very encouraging of that. And I can remember a lot of conversations of like, I think you, you know, you're going to grow up to be an attorney. You, you love to <laughs> debate. You, you really to, disappointed her there, didn't you? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> you love to argue like, and she didn't try and squash that in me. Mm-hmm. She tried to direct it. Yeah. She tried to put it in like, if you're going to argue or debate, there's a right way to do that, a healthy way to do that. And do it for a right and, cause. And a, yeah. yeah. Um, but she didn't just try and keep me from asking questions or negotiating or debating. Um, she just taught me how to do it better. Mm-hmm. And y'all may disagree with that. Yeah. No, I, I, think no, that I agree with that. I think that's even interesting just thinking about because I think the um, the way I was raised, and mom, if you're listening, I'm sorry. You were a great mom and you loved me well. But I mean, it was like, it, it felt like at times there was a clear winner and a loser um, to arguments. And so even as you share that, I'm like, man, I wonder if that's why I just kind of, I feel like, and I can argue about silly things and dumb things or, mm-hmm. you know, theology a little bit, but like for the most part, I don't like confrontation. I don't want to get in an argument. I feel like you're very quick to, not like argue, but like have a discussion about something that maybe like we disagree with. Um, I'm talking to Daniel on this. I um, just th- processing through that a little bit. Of sure. Like, hmm, I wonder if that's why I don't. I definitely approach confrontation as the outcome of this as two winners. Yeah. Like it I, should be a win-win. I don't. And I, that is and not, I don't feel like. And, and I, I think just even you sharing that, that is, and I've tried to be good and invite Ellie into, cause Audrey's probably not a hundred percent there, but Ellie encouraging you like, if you disagree, please come up and mm-hmm. ask me why, but your heart behind how you're, if you come up and have With an attitude, attitude mm-hmm. you know, like dad, I, I don't know why you made me do this. Could you explain to me why that's a much different conversation and I'm trying, but it's definitely not something that I feel like is easy or natural for me. Right. And I don't want to be a parent that's like, well, I'm going to win this. Right. I think uh, one more thing on this, make communication a priority. You know, we're, we're, uh, 
we're kind of applying it to maybe confrontation stuff like that. Right. But I think just Sorry. in a general sense, no, that's, I mean, reading the description, that's kind of what it sounded like. But I think just communicating, making it a priority. And we talked about sure. in other things, you know, boosting your child's self-esteem, catch them being good, just keeping those communication lines open. Like you said, a car ride is such a great place to have a conversation, mm-hmm. turn the radio off or turn it on and sing with your yeah. kids. But Turn it off. Ask some questions. Um, you know, I, I told you this, and we're kind of going through this in our parenting. Every I can sit down with one of my kids, and I can look them in the eyes and have awkward conversations. I can tell them I love them and it not be super uncomfortable for mm-hmm. them. I was not that kid. So my dad learned that about me, and he would let me off the hook in the awkwardness, but he would write me letters. Yeah. And I still have the letters Mm -hmm. like because I would listen through that way and I would listen the other way, but it just made me so uncomfortable, you know, to, to, for that to happen. I'm not a physical touch person. So like when my dad would hug me, it was like, (laughs) Oh my gosh, please stop hugging me. (laughs) Um, so we have one kid who it's like, we need to figure out how to, communicate differently because it some of that stuff does make them uncomfortable Mm -hmm. and so we have to find other ways to keep those communication lines open and as difficult as it is and it's one of the for me it's been one of the most difficult things as i've grown into different parenting phases is just be willing to experience the awkward with your kids Mm -hmm. at the same time Mm -hmm. and nobody likes it it's uncomfortable to sit down and have an awkward conversation with your kid. You just have to do it. Yeah. And I mean, do it in the least awkward way possible for them. But like, I'm not looking to shame or embarrass my kids, but you do have to just have difficult conversations with them. Yeah. But when you communicate often, it becomes a normal part and they're not so off put. Mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. Missy, did you have something you want to share? You kind of look like you I did. just, I totally agree with you. I am not a physical touch person. I am not good at we face, know. To, <laughs> face to face, <laughs> hard conversations. Um, I communicate with both of my kids. If it's a really hard thing, I will communicate through um, writing or a text message or mm-hmm. something. And they will talk a hundred times more if I do it that way. Yeah. Not to say that we didn't have hard conversations. We definitely did. And I think I said it to you the other day. Keep talking, keep talking, keep talking. Mm -hmm. When you have teenagers, they have to know, no matter how weird or awkward this is, mom and dad are going to bring it up. Johnny is very much... Tackle it right now. I'm going to get... Nothing's off limits for him. Nothing's off limits. He gets to the root of the issue. Yep, come here. We're going to talk, you know, and I have to give him, you know, like you're saying, Minda will touch your leg under the table or whatever. (laughs) I'm looking at him like, not now. (laughs) Don't do it. You know, now is not the time. He's not great at reading the room when it comes to those situations, but he is quick to get to the heart of the issue. We're going to talk about it. We're going to have it out, and this is how it's going to go. I'm more like okay, it's going to be this timing and I need to write this letter or say this thing and I have to get it all together. But there is always communication. If you stop communicating, you're yeah. you're going to be in trouble. If you are fortunate enough to be co-parenting and you're not doing it on your own, yes, um, you will recognize that you and your spouse probably balance each other mm-hmm. out and bring different strengths yep, to that. For sure. Because we're, Summer is definitely more like you, Misty, mm-hmm. and I am more like Johnny. Yeah. Um, where I want to deal with it right then. And sometimes she's getting me to hit the brakes mm-hmm. and I have to, I've had to learn to listen to her and trust yeah. her in that yeah. and her instincts. And and she's had to learn too, for me that sometimes she just doesn't want to deal with something. Yeah. To address I it, agree. You know? yeah. And, well, that leads into good. number seven perfectly. Mm-hmm. Oh, does it? Which is be flexible and willing to adjust your parenting mm-hmm. style. Mm-hmm. If you often feel, Feel let down by your children's behavior. Perhaps you have unrealistic expectations. Parents who think in shoulds, for example, my kid should be potty trained by now, might find it helpful to read up on the matter or talk to other parents or other development specialists. Kids' environments have an effect on their behavior, so you might be able to change that behavior by changing the environment. If you find yourself constantly saying no to your two-year-old, look for ways to alter your surroundings so that fewer things are off limits this will cause less frustration for both of you. Obviously, as your child changes, you'll gradually have to change your parenting style. 
Teens tend to look less to their parents and more to their peers, but continue to provide guidance, encouragement, appropriate discipline while allowing your teen to earn more independence and seize every available moment to make a connection. I feel schizophrenic in my parenting right now (laughs) because I have them in each category. Mm -hmm. And it has been really difficult for me to put on a teen hat and a toddler hat and sometimes having to do that within a 60 second window it feels like i'm crazy person (laughs) i'm just admitting that on here and i'll that would be hard i'll talk to a five-year-old like a 13 year old and i'll talk (laughs) to a 13 year old like a five-year-old and And then then i have a dog like a human (laughs) (laughs) i don't have that that anymore anymore. he doesn't have that problem anymore (laughs) also said something about getting rid of one of our kids because i got rid of the dog no um (laughs) Yeah, and then I have to make a lot of apologies. Mm-hmm. More to my older kids who I treat like little kids. And maybe we can add that as a number 10, just being Seriously. willing to say you're sorry yeah. Yeah. or that you're wrong. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Absolutely huge. Mm-hmm. And the more it's different, you know, obviously when you go from one to two kids, all of a sudden this flexibility and willing to adjust has to grow exponentially like just going from one to two because my first two maybe are the most opposite human beings Mm -hmm. and then you know the third one's a little bit like the first one and cal i don't know (laughs) i don't i don't know what it's about (laughs) um but it seems like the more you add to the quiver (laughs) The more you have to adapt and overcome feels like I'm in the Marines at this point (laughs) with child rearing. Um, And like, and again, I know I'm just like maybe getting some free counseling here, but you just always question. I always question. I think I'm doing everything wrong. I just, I don't know if I'm doing any of this right. I feel like I'm letting them all down and trying to talk yourself off that ledge quite frequently. I think I I agree with you. I feel that way. Um, and I think it's really important as parents for us to have other parents that, have, that are done with the stage that you're at, that mm-hmm. you can ask questions of and that they can speak into your parenting. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, you see it all the time on Facebook where a mom will be like, you know, my kid hasn't pooped in two weeks. What should I do? You know, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, um, depending on the topic. But we got to be really careful of who we're allowing to speak into our lives. And I mean, Misty probably could count. She need more hands to count the time I've sat in your office going, <laughs> is my kid normal? <laughs> Am I ruining my kid? Um, and having people in your life that you can ask very direct questions of, Hey, when your Mm -hmm. kids hit this Mm preteen, you know, age, what did you do? And, you know, how did you navigate this? You know, we had a conversation a week, I think last week about, you know, Hey, we got to have some awkward conversations coming up with Ellie. And what do you think about this or that? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, um, having those people in your life to speak into your parenting style and what maybe needs to be put to death and what needs to be, Mm -hmm you know, implemented or learned is really important. Yeah. Well, that's why I said in the introduction, I introduced Misty is also a jack of all trades. Cause I, I mean, I didn't it, know what he said there. <coughs> I didn't hear the jack of all utility. trades. Part. Yeah. You yeah. Said all utility. around utility player. <laughs> like, it's what? a baseball term. <laughs> Means you're good at everything. Yeah. Like, because I mean, you probably spend a quarter of your work hours as like the staff counselor. <laughs> She needs her five cent. Yeah, like five cent I'm cent. the last person that should be counseling. I am the person who apologizes to my firstborn on the regular. I'm like, I am so sorry. You were the test dummy. Yep. I, <laughs> Emphasis <we> on dummy. <laughs> we messed up so much. I it, When it says, you know, something about here, it said something about expectations or mm-hmm. comparing was huge for me. In my yeah. 20s, when I was first a parent, I'm looking at these other parents like, oh, well, we have to do that. They're doing that, so we have to do that. Oh, look how their kid behaves. Mine should do that. Well, I had 
the opposite of what most of those kids were. And I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. And praise God for people like Pat Nichols, who, and Amanda Davis, and those ladies who came alongside me here and were like, they're going to be just fine, you know. <laughs> um, Amanda had a strong-willed firstborn son, and she was a godsend to me in talking about that. Pat and Dave, same thing. And then Pat ended up being Hayden's first-grade teacher. Oh, I'm so thankful for yeah. those teachers who did not make me feel like I was a terrible parent because my kid was doing the things Acting he was doing fool. in school. <laughs> um, you well, know, they would and always... you have two kids of your own, and, yeah. like, I'm um, – Again, thinking Endgame, I like your two kids, mm -hmm. but you also have this exponential effect because you've been a part of so many kids' lives. Like, we don't necessarily have that. You know, like, I was in student ministry for 10 years, so I, I have some teenage stuff that maybe I, I've seen. Same with you. You've had some kids' ministry, student ministry experience and again, I'm not, I'm not trying to make you feel old, but like to have that oh, many years is. with that age range, <laughs> so many years <laughs> in that age range, it, it's just, it would be stupid to not sit down and ask you, I mean, is this normal? Since before I started <laughs> junior high, so many years. Nick was born the year Johnny and I started dating. <laughs> it's a good year. Yeah. It's a good year. So I, I mean... So you just have that exponential effect of seeing a ton of test cases of what <laughs> happens when a parent does this and when they don't do this yeah. and stage of life things. So it would just be stupid yeah. to not sit down and ask someone those questions. Um, so, yeah, we have to be flexible, Pivot. willing to adjust, Pivot. willing to have humility to go, I think I'm doing this wrong mm -hmm. and I need I need to make some some changes. Yeah, and I'll just say as far as – the comparison game and expectation, like we, we've all fallen victim to that, mm -hmm. but um, we have to be really careful that we're not parenting our kids based on our needs mm -hmm. um, versus theirs. Yeah. Sure. You know, there's a whole that, lot of, I'm a failure as a parent. If I can't make yeah. my kid look like those other kids yep. and mm -hmm. what a huge, huge mistake. Yep. Yeah. And parenting out of that, even that woundedness, you know, yep. a lot of times you'll see generational stuff where, mm -hmm. you know, this person had just an awful childhood and like even making statements like I'm going to fix what happened, yeah. which I, I understand and I appreciate and love the heart right. of what they're trying to do. But now you're just trying to parent towards specific behaviors yep. and Where not to hearts. Yeah. And I think like a great example of that is, um, you know, I was raised in a, um, for a season in a disciplinarian kind of tyrant, my, yeah. my stepdad air quotes, um, very discipline heavy, not a loving, encouraging person at all. Um, so I could now, if the thing that you see a lot of parents do is, well, I'm going to be the opposite of that. I don't want my kids to always be in fear. Yeah. So they're not going to have rules like that. Mm -hmm. They're not going to ever, they're not going to ever question whether or not I love them because I'm never going to discipline them or spank them. Well, you're not parenting your child. Right. Yeah. You're addressing your own issues, hurt and wounds. Yeah. Like, and that's yeah. not healthy parenting. Number eight, show that your love is unconditional. As a parent, you're responsible for correcting and guiding your kids. But how you express your corrective guidance makes all the difference in how a child receives it. When you have to confront your child, avoid blaming, criticizing, or fault-finding, which hurts self-esteem and can lead to resentment. Instead, try to nurture and encourage, even when disciplining your kids. Make sure they know that although you want and accept better next time, your love is there no matter what. Yeah, <laughs> I I grew up with what I feel like was a dad that was a strong disciplinarian. However, he was always, the first thing was always a conversation about his love for me. Mm -hmm. Before, you know, I got spankings. Before any spanking, it was like sitting on the bed. And again, as I would have rather you just 
beat me senseless and have this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> as uncomfortable as it was, it was always like, hey, this is happening. A, because I love you and I want something better for you. And here's exactly why this is happening. And then it happened. That mm-hmm. always happened. Uh, my dad never like hit me out of anger, which you would think because I had such a good example that I would have followed that. And I am not as good at stating love before, before punishment. Um, so I, I had that and looking back, I appreciate that. And when I'm having a disciplinary conversation with my kids, especially as they've gotten older and it's like, well, let me explain why before I jump into like, here's what you did wrong. Here's how you were wrong. Um, it's always like, you need to know, I really love you. I think you are an amazing person, but here's where this fell short. I don't always do it, but I try. We try to avoid, um, and, and obviously they're getting out of this stage or are out of this stage, but like using the language, like, you know, you're in trouble cause you were bad. Um, and more so trying to talk about the decision that was made and how that this was a bad thing. I, I really, no, I kind of disagree with blaming, criticizing or fault finding. I, I'm not, I mean, I, I feel like I understand where they're coming from, but I also like, this is your fault. <laughs> I mean, I've been pulled into you guys' office because of something I've done or said that like, Hey, this isn't right. And it's like, yeah, I got to own up to, I made a poor decision or, mm-hmm. you know, and it's my fault. Yeah. It is my fault because it was my choice. <clears throat> Again, how that's done and the way it's done changes based on how old your kid, what stage, yeah. how much they can understand or or, or whatever. I well, you a- talked about in last episode, you, you touched on this about being truthful. Mm-hmm. And I feel like what we raise when we don't confront or I don't want to say blame them, but like when we're not truthful with them, you made a choice. It was the wrong choice. Mm -hmm. It hurt somebody else. It's hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. They grow up to become adults that don't blame themselves. They find no faults in themselves and they don't take responsibility. Mm -hmm. I have a, a story that goes along with that. It just made me think of, it's one of our huge parenting moments. Um, Hayden went through a little period of time in junior high where he was bullied by some kids. And then he went through a period where he grew seven inches in one year (laughs) and was was suddenly back into the the crowd he wanted to be in and things seemed to be going well. I got a phone call one night from a mom who said, "Um, are you Misty Hagman? Yes. I'm friends with someone you know. And they said, you might want to know this. I'm Okay. Um, your son has been bullying my son. And I said, okay, please explain what has exactly happened. You know, she told me in detail what had happened. I remember it was the first snowy night of the winter and it was coming down really hard. Roads were dangerous. I did not care. I called Hayden out of his room. Excuse me. I called Hayden out of his room, and he said, what? And I said, I got this phone call. You guys have all heard this story. I don't know if I have. I don't think I have. Misty. Really? So um, I said, I just got a phone call from this kid's mom, and he just stared at me. And I said, do you have anything to say for yourself regarding what she said? And he just stared at me. I said, so what she's telling me is true. And he said, mm-hmm. And I said, go get your clothes on. And Johnny's just looking at me. And I (laughs) said, (laughs) I said, he goes, no, mom. I said, go get your clothes on. We're going for a ride. And he, cause I had asked the mom, can we come over? Are you home? And she said, we are. I said, we will be there. And so he's like, don't make me do it. Literally as a junior high kid who hasn't been spanked in a long time, he said, beat me, do whatever you want to (laughs) do. Do not make me do this. I said, get your clothes on and meet me in the car. I was beyond livid coming from a parent who had watched her kid be bullied now Mm -hmm. having to deal with the bully oh i'm like we are going to make a statement with this right here right now you are never going to forget this and um i drove 20 mile an hour across town to this person's house all slow for you 
It was storming. It, it was, was a, a winter storm. storm. She's still driving the <laughs> speed limit in a snowstorm. It's 20. Anyway. It's 25. <laughs> so we went all the way there, though. I said to him, you know what it's like to be bullied. You know that you are better than this. Why would you do this? And, of course, there was more kids involved, but being the... Um, six foot tall redhead in the group of junior hires makes you stand out more than others. And, and your responsibilities for him, not and everybody else. Exactly. I'm like, you are responsible for your own behavior, whether you're in a group of people or by yourself. And you don't know what this kid is going through at home. You don't know what his home life is like. Da, 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 da. How dare you? I love you. That's why I'm taking you here because you're better than this. And so took him to the person's house. We sat in the living room with the mom and the son and a lot of the things God gave me the words <laughs> on the way there, apparently. I'm like, you don't know. Does he have a dad? Dad has to work in another town because he couldn't find a job at the time here. Um, you don't know. Maybe he has a death in the family. His sibling died at this time of the year, and the kid's having a hard time right now. You know, I'm like, thank you, Lord, for, <laughs> for putting those things in there. But um, he sat there trembling on that couch in that person's home. And he apologized to the kid. He's like, it will never happen again. They ended up talking, becoming friends, not like hangout friends, but, yeah. you know, I was mortified. He was mortified, but I don't know why I had this overwhelming, I have to do this. Mm -hmm. It has to be a big statement or he is going to be like, I can get away with it. Yeah. And I will not let my kid get away with it. And it made a statement, Hayden, if you're mm. listening, <laughs> <laughs> oh, he will never, ever forget that. And honestly, now he's probably pleasant. the kind that would oh, stick up for uh, the he underdog. He would never let that happen. And yeah. I had an, uh, a conversation with the principal later, and I told him about that incident. And he said, you know, I was a kid who was bullied. And once I was not bullied anymore, I swore that I would never let that happen again. So the fact that it happened in a group situation Hayden had to let them know, I'm one of you. I'm okay now. Yeah, like, yeah. I, I've made it. Keep me here. He said, and so he chose to follow along. And it's not his character because he's the one. The principal is actually calling me to tell me how Hayden was standing up for somebody. And I said, I'm so glad to get this phone call because we did not have that situation a couple months ago. Yeah. So it was it was a really good <clears throat> learning situation for everyone. I was going to add that because that must have been right around when I came. Uh, he, yeah, junior high. I can't remember exactly. Maybe maybe, maybe a year, grade. year after or a year prior to me coming, mm -hmm. but like that is something that really sticks out in my head. Is Hayden always was a protector? Yeah, he is. He is a protector. So yeah. it shocked me that my kid was doing it. You know. So. But but I'm saying, and that's probably a part of why that's a huge yeah. part of who he is. Yeah. Because you were willing to. Yeah. place blame yeah. and criticize. It, but he said, you know, I can't believe you made me do that. I said, if I didn't love you, I would have just slapped you on the hand and said, don't do it again. Yeah. Yep. I said, you had to know how devastating this is for people. I mean, you've lived it. So, I don't know. Yeah, that unconditional love is, you know, sometimes you wonder, like, can I really do that? You know, do I have that capacity? You know, one thing I always tell my kids is there's nothing you ever say or do to me that will stop me from yeah. loving you. Even yeah. if you feel like you stop loving me, mm -hmm. uh, that's just always there. But, you know, when you think about the love of Christ, you're like, man, I don't know if I have that capacity. Mm -hmm. I hope through the power of the Holy Spirit I do, but. Yeah, yeah that was going to be a follow-up question that I asked is, is it possible to have unconditional love for our kids? Um, and I think if we're not careful in our parenting, we can teach our kids that, our love is conditional, and if you live within these conditions, you will be loved. But if you live outside of them, you will be unloved. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think you see it all the time where parents and kids don't talk to their parents, you know, don't talk to each other anymore. That's a broken relationship. There's probably still love there, but mm -hmm. the relationship's broken. And so um, that's something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about is, you know, I don't want my kids to make decisions because they're like, if I do this, my dad won't love me, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to do it. That's not the reason I want them yeah. sure. to be living because then what happens when men or I are out of the picture, they're at college, high school, whatever, yeah. and now they're like, in that situation like Hayden, like what do I have to do to get, mm -hmm. you When know? it's that fine line of even in our own spiritual lives with the fear of the Lord. Sure. I don't, I don't want to do anything that's going to disappoint the heart of my father. And 
I don't think that's an unhealthy thing. I don't ever question, does he love me? But it's like, can I still disappoint or break the heart of the father through my actions? Yeah, I think that happens. And it does motivate me to maybe live a little differently and to treat people differently. And, you know, applying that to our parenting, it's like, I don't want them to ever think they would lose my love, but like, is this going to disappoint the heart of my father? And that's a little bit of like weird, unique, healthy fear mm-hmm. of that, that kind of keeps us on the path of righteousness versus on the broad path. But all right, last one, know your own needs and limitations as a parent, face it. You're an imperfect parent. You have strengths and weaknesses as a family leader Recognize your abilities. I am loving and dedicated. Vow to work on your weaknesses. I need to be more consistent with discipline. Try to have realistic expectations for yourself, your partner, and your kids. You don't have to have all the answers. Be forgiving of yourself. Try to make parenting a manageable job. Focus on the areas that need the most attention rather than trying to address everything all at once. Admit it when you're burned out. Take time out from parenting and do things that make you happy. Focusing on your needs does not make you selfish. It simply means you care about your own well-being, which is another important value to model for your children. I didn't know taking a timeout of parenting was an option on the table. <laughs> it's like the old save by the bell when he would call a timeout and everything would freeze. Yeah. I agree and disagree with this. I think one thing, and this is, you know, we hear it all the time, but parents... Uh, a married or a couple, married couple who their kids leave the house and their lives kind of just end, whether they get a divorce or whatever, because all they live their life for is their kids. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which I think is, is an unhealthy option. I don't know if I have a lot more to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I got to say about that. <laughs> I. Yeah, I, I kind of in the same boat you are. I don't know if you get to call a timeout on parenting. <laughs> um, even when those of you, I mean, you have one that's out of school, out of the house. You were joking the other day, like, when she's home, she'll still be like, hey, can I go? You're like, you don't have to ask me for permission. <laughs> Ellie does that, too, at 21 years. I'm like, you're 21. Yeah. You don't have to ask permission. Yeah, I appreciate the heads up. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's not an ask at this point. It's right. a tell. <laughs> Um, also move out. No. (laughs) Um, so I don't think you get to take a time out even when your kids are adults and you're a grandparent or, and obviously none of us know that world yet, but I do think they made a statement about taking care of yourself because that is modeling something for your kids. I am a big believer in that with lots of facets like spiritually taking care of yourself to, for your kids to see you sitting mm-hmm. at the kitchen island with your bible open not that you're doing it for show but you know if it's 7 a.m and you're sitting there and one of the kids gets out of bed early comes down to get a bowl of cereal they're not going to say anything because he's five or six but he sees mom sitting there with a bible open you know journaling and mm-hmm. like she's taking care of herself someone's seeing that um I um, feel that way with fitness. Like I have no problem telling my kids, no, dad's got to go to the gym or dad's got to do this because this is a value for me. I need to take care of myself. And hopefully your kids learn that as much as they learn the bad stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't think I disagree with anything you said maybe, but, um, I think it's important, and this goes to what Nick's saying, um, and I'm not sure, I guess it's answering the question. I think it's important that our kids know that they're not the center of our universe. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Um, we have to parent, and we don't get to yeah. take a break from parenting, but part of parenting is showing them that they're not the center Ooh, of the I universe. I agree, yeah. And so if, if Summer and I, and I, I mean, especially at certain seasons of parenting, if we have a dedicated time for the two of us where we're sitting down on the couch having a meaningful conversation and our kids come in and, you know, you, of course you don't ever want to miss opportunities, but our kids needed to know like, you know, hey, can you do this for me? No. No, I can't. You can wait. You yeah. can wait an hour because we're having a conversation. Like the world does not end because you showed up. You want something from me. Yeah. Um, again, 
age appropriate, communication matters. Um, but, but I want to model for them that everything is not about them and that our marriage is incredibly important and our love for each other matters, you know, and then doing that in healthy ways for them too. So, yeah. And even the things you value are important as well. Not that they're more important than your kids, but like, you know, you got to take time to go to the gym and you got to take time to, there's nothing wrong with taking time to hang out with your friends because you want to model healthy friendships for your kids. Right. Um, yeah. No, I think, I think that's spot on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think maybe the, uh, the nuance is in like, you don't just get to check out to do whatever you want, whenever you want. Right. And yet like we live our lives and our kids, I really, I think that is maybe in the top five mistakes parents make is their lives are their kids. Yeah. Um, and Min and I have struggled with it at times where we go out to eat on a one-on-one date night and we, um, it happened a few years ago and it was like one of those moments where we're like, we really got to change this where we did not have anything to talk about. Absolutely nothing. We just sat there and stared at each other <laughs> and then we, you know. Would talk. We talked about the girls the whole yeah. time, and we got done with that date, and was just like, "We got to change it up. We got to do something different." And one thing we did, and I know that this isn't really what it's about, but we got um, off Amazon. There was like a deck of cards that was questions to ask your spouse, and it's just like I don't know, random, literally yeah. all over the place, random questions. Um, and we did that on one of our date nights and it felt really dumb to do it. Cause we're sitting at a table with these, you know, cards <laughs> in our hand or whatever, but it was one of the most refreshing things mm-hmm. and it was really healthy for us as a couple. And also I think as parents too. Yeah. I think the trap that young moms fall into, and I know I fell into it big time was the comparison game and the, I have to do it all. I have to make everything look perfect. It has to look a certain way. I have to make all the homemade snacks. I have to make the all the decorations. I have to participate in this thing at school. I have to do all of it to be a good parent. Mm-hmm. And then you burn out and you're cranky with yeah. your kids. And when you can let some of that go and be like, I don't have to do all those things. I am a good parent and I know it. We yeah. put so much pressure on ourselves, especially as the mom. To it might have been you and I talking, I don't know, this week. Maybe not, but... I'm Daniel, by the way. This is Daniel, <laughs> yes. I do forget to do that, I'm sorry. Um, it is one natural benefit of having more kids is because you legitimately can't. can't. <laughs> and they all know they're not the center yeah. of our universe. Yep. It's just a very natural outcome, and like y- you tend to let yourself off the hook, I think, a little bit mm-hmm. easier. I do think moms maybe struggle with this probably more than dads yeah. naturally. Yeah. I don't know. I think um I think moms more often than not struggle with guilt. Yeah. Especially over the take time for myself, mm-hmm. invest in my own friendships, relationships, even like um for Summer and I to try and do a a short like let's do a weekend getaway. There's like this mom guilt that kicks in with, mm-hmm. oh, we should have the kids with us. Yeah. No, <laughs> definitely don't <laughs> want the <laughs> kids. <laughs> they do not want to be want to scar them for life. <laughs> <laughs> they shouldn't be here. It's <laughs> the <laughs> opposite of what is good. <laughs> but no, that's that that seems to be a difficult thing. I think, um, but I, I and I think that's true of like. Um, watching summer and her friends just try and get together let's go out to dinner together mm-hmm. and there's this kind of looming mom guilt of oh i need to be home and mm-hmm. my kids are home so i want to be home mm-hmm. they're not that fun to hang out with like just <laughs> yeah, go it'll be okay for one <laughs> evening if you, i think survive. this is a bigger conversation and we don't have the time to talk about it, so i'm just going to drop this and then run away i think a lot of that fault is at the hands of the church mm. Because we talk about the Proverbs 31. I mean, how many ladies say that? Oh, yeah. Like, to be this Proverbs 31. That's not why that was written. <laughs> and you will never be that. And and then when it comes to talking about men, it's like, well, don't cheat on your wife and you'll be good. 
It's like, oh, I'm doing pretty good. You know? <laughs> One thing. I'm rocking it. It's not what I got out of the Bible. But <laughs> Proverbs 31 was like, well, you got to make your kids clothes and you got to have all these foods and make a hot meal and work the fields. And <laughs> like, I mean, is it the worst thing? <laughs> so it's, I don't I just think the church has not done a very good job of actually talking about this topic and women have taken the brunt of moms have taken the brunt of that i feel like but yeah. that's a conversation for another day but i get pretty worked up about that one yeah misty any closing thoughts moms take a break for yourself mm. i i treat would, yourself i would not take a break you have to have limitless energy, well, limitless. You tend not to take breaks still. I yeah. Know. It is kind of part of <laughs> will, the DNA of certain people to not want to stop. But um, when I look back now and think, I never wanted to take, and if I did, it was like I had to explain myself. Mm -hmm. If Johnny pulled in the driveway, I would jump up off the couch. I just had to sit down for a second. Like, I had. How it's like when silly. Mickey buys any article clothing, it was on sale. Yeah. <laughs> it's Marshalls. Still do that. It has pockets. <laughs> it's Marshalls, ten dollars. Dude, it is a bonus point if it's got pockets. I got jeans at Walmart the other day for eleven. Dude, Walmart's Steal. stepping it up. Oh, girl, They're stepping it up. No, but seriously, if take you a break. could give one piece, understanding out of a place of humility that we do not have all the answers and we screw things up, but if you could give like. This has been the most helpful thing for me as a parent. Piece of advice on the way out the door. What would it be? Mm. Quit comparing. That is really solid. It's about heart, not behavior. Oh, that's good. Love it. Make sure you're more. Oh, that is me. <laughs> it's like the <laughs> loudest rumble ever. Make sure you're more concerned about being loving than being right. <laughs> Let me argue with that on that. Uh, life's a garden, dig it. No. <laughs> the words of Joe Dirt, uh, Joe Dirte. Uh, I heard something last week that has just kind of blown my mind, and I've probably heard it a thousand times, but it stuck this time. Uh, Pastor Chris Hodges was talking about in my 20s and 30s, I thought I'd write a parenting book. And he's like, now in my 50s, I my kids are grown. I just realized I learned how to pray. Mm -hmm. And I was like, man, that that one, mm -hmm. that got to me. And definitely, I, there was a podcast, was, and he actually s said, like, here's what to pray for. You know, because we always talk about pray for your kids. Like, what do I pray for? And he's like, here's what you pray for. It was just really, really mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. But I know my mom, um, I can remember her telling us that for years and years and years, I mean, I'm talking like when we were probably 10 years old and on, um, my mom prayed for my brother and I and our future spouses like every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And very specific things, but yeah. yeah, That meant the world to me. Yep. Do we have an unofficial sponsor today? Unofficial sponsor is LaCroix. LaCroix? LaCroix for French sparkling audience. water. <laughs> I love Dan Bonnie. He calls it LaCroix water. <laughs> <laughs> it has the essence of, this one is tangerine. Yeah, sorry about crotch. that snort. <laughs> <laughs> the, the essence of crotch. That's not good. I think we're going to need to change the unofficial sponsor here. <laughs> it, it's, it says that it's naturally essenced. Um, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but ingredients only carbonated water, naturally essenced. Yeah, I love. Just run a tangerine by it, <laughs> dude. There are so many great mean tweets about Lacroix. It makes I've read them before and just literally could not even. Yeah, like, it is like it they them. didn't actually put any tangerine yeah. in yeah. it. They just oh, yeah. put them on a conveyor belt next to it. Like <laughs> catch the essence. It does. It's it's flavor by osmosis. One was um, like. LaCroix's are like what like drinking Kool-Aid is for a ghost or another <laughs> one was um, <laughs> the strawberry flavored LaCroix was made by someone who had never tasted strawberries but it was described <laughs> to them it is an acquired taste I it feel is. like the first time I drank one I was like why Terrible. would anybody Terrible. drink that and now I there's certain flavors I enjoy. I don't enjoy all the flavors. So, so Lemon tastes my, like Pledge or 
Oh, yeah. yeah. the lemon, the one, uh, yeah, the Emma. lemoncello. That That's one, that awful. one is better. No, awful. You guys like that one? It is the worst flavor. <laughs> it tastes like a flower. It's awful. <laughs> like I'm drinking a garden. There's nothing, tangerine is the best. There's some Tangerine's flowers the that are edible. Grapefruit, That's really good. Pamplemousse. <laughs> it's really good. I don't know why it's called that. But I don't they, like grapefruit, but I like the pamplemousse yeah, flavor. You you call lime lime, and you call grapefruit pamplemousse. <laughs> why? <laughs> why did they do that? Is this really an unofficial sponsor? Yeah, or are we just trash. So let me let me share my my journey because my my, my life journey. is a pillar of health and wellness. It is, as you can see by my temple. Yes. Um. So like eight years ago, is it yours or is it the Lord's? <laughs> Whatever. It actually just says a temple. Yeah. But. Um, so like eight years ago, no one believes this, but I gave up uh, Coke, which in Texan means all soda. <laughs> yeah. Coca-Cola for the record. No, not- <laughs> no, I gave up Coke, not Coca-Cola. I gave up Coke, which is all sodas and pop. You know, I, around I just, here, people oh. think that's a drug, yeah, right? I just mean not cocaine. Yeah, oh, that's yeah, what we're yeah, talking yeah. about. Oh, that's, yeah, we're yeah. that's fair. Yeah. That's no, fair. I didn't give that up. No, yeah. <laughs> I'm still doing no. Um So I haven't had an actual soda in like eight years now. Um, which is astonishing because if I did, I would be like 400 pounds because as it is not doing that great, but (laughs) so when I gave up soda, Summer was like, you need to drink LaCroix. It's amazing. And it will help like replace that that carbonation. Mm -hmm. So I did. And it was awesome awful yep like the most awful thing and i thought this is stupid i'm just going to drink normal water and then that craving for that bubbly goodness comes when i first started drinking Lacroix, i used to mix them with like crystal light <laughs> oh, it's really good actually do you know yeah. that if you but, add stevia to it yeah. it will erupt like a really? volcano mm-hmm. well, that sounds like fun on our I next episode missy run and get some stevia <laughs> so um i will say once i started drinking them I, now i love them if i try and even take a sip like summer wanted or one of the kids ordered a root beer float and so i'm like oh, i'm gonna take a sip of this just awful oh no but, i still freaking love <laughs> but if i have like if i have a sip of coke it literally tastes like just straight sugar syrup. It's the most I can't drink Coke, but thing. I'll occasionally, like every five, six months, I'll drink a Diet Coke, and it's like I'm mainlining it. It's like, <laughs> oh, <that's> so good. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing I'll wake up in a 12-pack. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're if you're struggling to get um, give up a uh, sugar addiction from like Coke, Mountain Dew, or something like that, and you've tasted these before and they're absolutely terrible, you're right. But if you can, like, power make through. It, if you could power, lie to yourself enough. Yeah, power through that first few weeks. Such a winning then, recommendation. Yeah. And then start hey, drinking this them. is absolute dog water. These but you drink it long enough, it's all you know. Goes on. I, Honestly, it's the truth. It this is. may be the eighth wonder of the world. A company is convinced <laughs> the, <laughs> the main public that this is actually tasty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So all right. drink LaCroix. Well, that's a great unofficial sponsor yep, thank you thank LaCroix, you. for powering this podcast uh on our next episode we'll talk about i don't know we'll figure that yeah. out uh thanks for tuning in if again if you guys have any questions or comments feel free to reach out we'd love to hear from you we should do a podcast on like that was the ending the the, <laughs> the top nine ways to be a child like how to how to kill it as a kid <laughs> Yeah, because our audience is very, yeah. a lot of children all tuning, are tuning in. in after they watch all these YouTube families open Christmas presents. I'm just, saying, <laughs> I'm just saying we're all still kids. So That's, we're somebody's kid. I'm crushing it. We're somebody's kid. Child of the Lord. All right. Thanks, guys. We'll catch you next time. <laughs>